All right, thank you. Uh, and thanks for inviting me to come speak. Um, yeah, opinions I've got. You're going to discover that. I've got, I've got opinions. Um, so all this stuff, for the, I believe the reason you guys are here is because you're interested in, in improving the energy efficiency of electronics and, by extension, computer systems based on those electronics. I'm all for that. I think that's a great plan. I'm really glad you guys are working on that. I hope you all succeed brilliantly. Um, I don't think I can personally add a whole lot to what you're doing on that, so I decided to pick on something I think is getting not enough attention, but still is relevant to what you're doing, I think. And, and so you'll see that. I, I've, the way I view my talk is as a higher level sort of umbrella over top of the, of the um, kinds of work that you're doing, that you're, that you're attempting to do. And I think it's the elephant in the room, because I think it's been with us for a long time. We've just have chosen not to pay much attention to it. And so far, we've gotten away with it. But my claim is, is in the future, we may not be so lucky and it might be that we need to start sort of doing more adult level um, uh, design, system design especially. So you'll see what I mean in a minute. Um, so as far as I'm concerned at this point, it used to be that we could design systems that were woefully energy inefficient. People would still buy them, they would still use them. You'd get great results from them. What's not to like? Oh, it burns a little more, more energy than it should have. Well, that's fine because people are still paying me good money to, to use my system, so what, what's the problem? But I think today, energy efficiency is defined as good. It means if you didn't design the system to be energy efficient, you screwed up. You did a stupid thing. It's, not, it's, it's required now. So it's kind of like if you remember Star Wars, Yoda, Yoda said, do or do not, there is no try. It's kind of like, well, there is no energy efficient. There's just good design and stupid design, right? And it's some system level thing. Um, and by the way, I think Yoda missed something. Um, like in Java, there actually is a try block. So there is a try, just, just thought I'd throw that in there. <laughs> I don't think it refutes his point, or maybe it does. I don't know. He didn't think that at all. <laughs> maybe he should have. He would have realized. And it would have ruined the entire movie, but apart from that. <laughs> now, I'm not saying energy efficiency is a done deal. It, it certainly isn't. And I think what you guys are doing is great. There's plenty left to do. But here's the important thing for me. I actually don't think there's any chance that we as a field are going to overlook the importance of becoming more energy efficient, that that's what's going to stop us from moving forward. We know that. That's why we're working on it. So it's great. But there's things we are overlooking, which also might screw us up. And that's what I'm trying to draw attention to. I think that's what's more fun to think about it, it, for me at the moment. Um, did you all see Shark, uh, Sharknado? I assume everyone's watched that. I mean, classic movie. Actually, it was terrible. I actually did watch it. It's terrible. So that's a Lego version of the Sharknado. And the, imagine ominous music, because what I'm about to tell you is somewhat apocalyptic. Uh, so here's the thing. Subashi set me, set me up perfectly for part of this, because to me, as a designer, what I want to avoid are surprises. I don't like surprises. Surprises are always bad, right? They, you, it never happens that someone says, your system's running 50% faster than you said it would. It doesn't happen. Instead, they come and they say, you promised me X, and when I run my thing, I get X over 2. And so I hate you, and you better fix it, or you owe me money. And, and that's, that's the real world, right? So let's, first of all, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to define bug as behavior other than what was intended or expected meaning surprises are bad, right? Well, here's some examples of bugs, which, which bother me as a system designer. Um, you can have bugs in the applications. I actually saw lots of those. When I was at Multiflow, I used to see, routinely see code that was being run on craze to do scientific exploration or, or design, and they would have assertions in the code. But if you just looked at me, you say, that assertion is false. It's not even true. And yet you're basing the result. This, the compiler's assuming you're right. It's not going to second guess your assertion. And it's going to compile the code. You're going to run it. You're going to think the answer's right. But you don't know, do you? Because you had a bug in your application. Um, bugs in the hardware are everywhere. As you saw, you saw Subashish's uh, curve that Intel's got. You know, the bugs are climbing. Bugs are climbing an exponential curve, in my personal opinion, because the transistor nut count is, is, is uh, climbing that same curve. And so we're using those transistors to build ever more complicated systems, and the bugs come along naturally because we don't know how to prevent them. We saw multiple bugs. Yeah, and they, oh, that's right. And trying to deal with the bug once you know about it. So to me, there's a scary part about latent bugs you don't know about because you don't know when they're going to bite you or how. And then there's once you know where they are, how do you track them down? How do you figure out what they are? How do you figure out what to do about the bug without introducing more bugs? You know, that's the world of software right there. So there's bugs in silicon, there's bugs in the algorithms. Everywhere you look, there's a chance for something to screw up in a way that you don't know and you can't anticipate directly. Once you've put a product out in the real world, you actually don't know which of those 14, or it's probably more than 14, they're just what I came up with off the top of my head when I was doing the slide. Um, but every one of them can matter to you. And so in the past, we have quote unquote done the best we could, in my opinion, on all of these. 
and weirdly, I mean, you could say, well, apparently our best has been good enough because we as an industry are, are building interesting things. People are buying them. Uh, it's, what's not to like? And my message is, yes, I agree. And to some extent, we have gotten away with that so far. But we'd better worry about whether we can keep taking that attitude because it might not be good enough in the very short term. It's coming, uh, the problem's coming up. Here's some examples of bugs. This was just this year. Intel found us, they called a specialized TSX Enterprise bug uh, in the Haswell chips. Uh, do you remember Chernobyl, the uh, nuclear plant? That's an example of both a design bug and an interface bug and a user bug. There were a lot of mistakes made in, in, uh, uh, all at the same time in that example. Um, it also, it, by the way, um, shows you, Chernobyl stands as an example of a cascade of errors. It's not one single thing that caused that plant to melt down. It was one thing after another after another, including user errors that made it worse, including people that misunderstood what they were seeing or their training wasn't sufficient. And then the fact that the design was fundamentally unstable in the first place under too low of a load. There's plenty of things that all co collided at once to make a perfect storm and melt that plant. Here's an example of, uh, you remember Clippy? So Clippy here is saying, it appears you're trying to launch the space shuttle. Would you like some help? Would you like to enter stable orbit or slam into a mountain? Now, the reason I think that's funny is because there's actually an equivalent of that in the real world that I actually know about. I visited, as part of DARP, I visited Nellis Air Force Base, and I watched the people flying the Predators. That's where they fly them from, in case you didn't know that. And I'm talking about flying them over in the Middle East. Now, the problem is, it, at one point they showed us a presentation uh, about uh, how they do that and, and, and so on, the scheduling and the people and whatever. And I learned a long time ago, if you really want to know the truth, you don't sit in the front row and listen to the bosses. You sit in the back row and listen to the engineers. So in this case, I was sitting in the back of the auditorium talking to the enlisted guys, the ones that actually run the show. And they were smirking at, cer at a certain place, and I asked them why. And he said, well, because the user interface that we just told you about that was so good with the joystick and flying the plane and all that, there's a, there's a time when that doesn't that actually bites you. And he said, there's a case where, for example, inside the original Predator, now this is a several years ago, um, that you, the pilot, have to know to reach inside, pull down menus on your screen, and turn a fan on. You have to do that. And if you don't do that, something will overheat, and that would be bad. But, so, so no, you don't want to do that. Every, you do this every day, and you get tired of it. So instead, you map those sequence of, fun, of functions into function keys at the top of your keyboard. And instead, you just go F1, F2, F3. And he said, you just do that with your hand after a while. That's all you do. Oh, I need the fan. And I said, yeah, well, OK, that, that sounds rational. So what's the problem? He said, well, guess what if you hit F2, F3, F4 instead? Easy to do, right? He said, the plane powers up, turns left 90 degrees, and slams into a concrete wall. And I went, oh, that can't be good for the plane. He said, no, it's a total write-off when that happens. <laughs> and I said, I, I'm, you're not speculating, are you? And he goes, oh, no, we're not speculating here. We know. The point is, our user interfaces can make, have serious consequences. And you have to think about these things when you set up the user interface. You can't blame the user later. It may, I mean, it's probably not, not fair to do that. Um, here's another one. Uh, there was a plane crash because it was a, what they called a software bug in the engines. That software bug was that somebody during maintenance had deleted a couple files you actually needed. <laughs> Whoops. So the code came along late. Oh, and by the way, that should, you, the first thing you should jump in your head is, wait a minute, why was that plane able to take off without it realizing it didn't have all the files that it needed. Why was that even possible? And the answer is because whoever designed the system didn't check for that. Why didn't they? Because I don't think they had the right attitude, and that's what I'm trying to push towards. <coughs> so our reach exceeds our grasp. So this is a sequence of self-driving cars that Google wants to do. And on the one hand, as a technologist, I love that picture. I think that's a really cool vision for what we're trying to do. On the other hand, also as a technologist, that scares the hell out of me. Because remember that pic the picture I just showed you with all the bugs? Every one of those cars has every one of those bugs. How many? I don't know. They don't know. You don't know. None of us know. So the question is, why? We are used to the idea that we should build systems, put them out there, and kind of see how they go. You know, see how they work. Uh, we did that with the space shuttle, and it's and it sort of worked most of the time. Well, maybe almost all the time. But they still had bugs, no matter how hard they tried. They still had bugs. And so I guarantee you, this is commercial silicon. I guarantee you there are bugs in the hardware, in the software, in the algorithms, in everywhere you look. Now the question is, are we getting ahead of ourselves here a little bit? And what should we do about it? So, and also, I'm not making the claim here by singling out self-driving cars. I'm not saying humans drive better. They certainly don't, right? I'm just saying that vision implies something about computer systems that we know aren't true. And we better make them true. It's going to become pretty important, potentially. So, 
How do we get towards robust hardware and software? It's not like I can give you a formula. It's, I would love to just give you a slide that says, here's what we do, just, just do this, problem solved. I don't think it's that simple. It, it, maybe, it's, it's, maybe it's just because I didn't think of the answer yet, but I choose to think of it as the problem's too hard and we're gonna need to be more subtle in our approach. Anyway, I don't want surprises, and so I broke the surprises down into three groups. There's immediate surprises, there's long-term surprises, and there's user interface surprises, of which I already gave you an example. Um, and my, my basic attitude, in case it hasn't already leaked out here, is that we already aren't good enough at designing systems to meet the specifications, which is all we hold ourselves to do so far. And I say that's not even enough. I want my system to deliver the intended mission. That's not the same as saying it meets the spec. I want it to hit the mission. I want it to never give up and never fail me in what I'm actually trying to accomplish, even if the spec didn't completely anticipate what I'm up, up against at the moment. That's what I really think we need, especially with a self-driving car. When a user goes off a cliff in a self-driving car, they're not gonna say, well, it's okay, it's just by bad luck that it wasn't in the specification. They're not gonna do that. And I think they'd be within their rights. So how do we avoid immediate surprises? Well, first of all, the category of design errata. I mean, as a designer, this is just your, your main you know, mission in life is to try to prevent these. And at least for me, I, I categorize design errata in at least two major groups. One is what I would call reasonable bugs, bugs that where we could get together, hash it out over a few days and say, okay, now we really know what this bug is. It's a complicated one. It's a it's a, it comes out of the nature of the system. It, it, it would be really hard to see this one coming. I also understand why our testing didn't find it. I'm not gonna hold you, you know, I'm not gonna yell at you for that one. But there's also bonehead moves where you're just plain screwed up, right? Those I will, as a design engineer, I will hold you accountable for those. So I think there's at least those two categories and I think there, we ought to find ways to at least kill off the bonehead stupid ones. And there still are some, it's, they get through. Um, there's, nowadays there's also hacks and attacks. You know, the fact is, that these, like picture the self-driving car, this is gonna come back in this talk. Just getting it right in the first place is hard enough. But getting it right and then have it be attacked by really smart people with bad intent, that's a whole other kettle of fish. That's, that, that raises the whole problem to, to a new level. And we have to get that right because they are out there. Um, the context and environment in which the product that you just designed will be used is also really important. And you better anticipate what that is because, well, you're going to see in a minute, but the more you use something, the more successful it is, the more likely it will be in some context that you didn't anticipate. And it's still better work. So now what do you do? You're the designer, you think your job is to say, I'm designing a product for this space. Use my product in that space, you have my guarantee that I did my darndest to make it work properly. And then they say, this works so well over here, I'm gonna try it over here. Now, now what do you say? Can you, can you just back off and say, well, I didn't say anything about what it would do. No, you really can't. You say, um, I, I did a really good general purpose robust design and the fact that you find useful somewhere else, I, more power to you and I sure hope it keeps working. Now these are just examples, and I'm not looking for a comprehensive technology or taxonomy. That wasn't really the point of the talk. Um, but I want to point out that it's, it's really easy to find these bugs. It's not hard at all. So it should scare you. It scares me. There's an example of something being used in its intended environment. It's not being hacked or attacked, and it's still, that was still the outcome. There's another one, you know, about the uh, Titanic. It's being used in its intended environment. It still went down. Human, human design systems that just plain failed. Here's one, so here's that self-driving car. And here's the part that should scare you, this part right here. A security researcher says he has tricked a LiDAR system into thinking a car has a wall in front of it. He, can, he bombards the system, or the sensor, with so many spurious sensors, that, uh, sorry, signals that the car that it's embedded in wouldn't move at all, because it thinks it's surrounded by phantom obstacles. That's the easiest possible hack. You can get creative like crazy about, oh, that, that's a good point. If I have a self-driving car that's trying to sense the world and I know how it's doing it and I can reach inside because it's not got good enough security, I could do all sorts of things to that vehicle. And won't it be entertaining to find out? If you're a, a person with bad intent but good technical skills, the, the world's your oyster with these things. All right, immediate surprises. Another one was uh, Brown's Ferry nuclear plant in Alabama in uh, 1975 darn near melted down. Not a lot of people know that, but it did. And here's why. The electricians were trying to track down an air leak in a c cable room, and you know how they did it? They lit a candle, and they used the candle to watch for the air currents. Well, they set the insulation on fire inside the walls. And when they did that, and it burned really, really well, and it took out all the control cables, and it took out all four of the systems that, that uh, cooled the core, and then it also took out the instrumentation that tells the operators how the core is doing. So it is just plain luck 
and, and heroic efforts that that plant didn't melt down in the presence of that situation. The designers did not anticipate that. Now you could, uh, my point here is, what should the designers have tried to anticipate? An open flame in the wall? I would say yes, they really should have. Now that we have this data point that says we overlooked a, a case that actually happened and it darn near made a mess in Alabama. Long-term surprises, so the lessons. And the lessons that I'm drawing from those instances for us in the electronics business is we better worry about things like noise margins. We do this already hoping to get the original system to work properly. I'm saying extend that to the length of the system that you think is gonna be out there. If it's gonna be for 40 years, then don't tell me about RFI tomorrow. Maybe it meets FCC tomorrow. That's great, that's required or you can't ship. What's it gonna be in 40 years? Worse, better? You better think about it, someone needs to. Um, implementation matters. The, the thing about the Browns Ferry plant was not just that they set the insulation on fire. The guy who designed the plant said, we better have triplicated cables because I don't want to lose one set of cables and then not have control of my plant. So I'll have three separate, you know, triplicate, I'll have a triplicated situation. Unfortunately, when they implemented that great idea, they ran the cables through the same spot in the wall. So it took them all out at the same time. You will see that theme multiple times today. Here's, a, here's another, well, so here's a separate one, but remember the triplicated one. You're going to see it again. Takata airbag. So if you got it in your car, you have one of these in all probability. Um, here's, a, here's what it looks like. Now, you know that there's an issue right now with these, with these canisters, right? These things are, are tending to blow up. Instead of deploying the airbag, they deploy the airbag and they also deploy the top of the metal can into you, which is really bad. It's not, your face wasn't designed for that. So the problem is there, um, there's, there's some corrosion that they believe is happening around this metal canister. What this thing's supposed to do, by the way, there's some propellants over here. And when you s basically set fire to them, they create a lot of nitrogen in a really big hurry, a fraction of a second. And the nitrogen's what blows up the bag. So that thing's supposed to let the nitrogen out, but leave the metal behind. And if it doesn't do that, then you're in trouble. So there, we've had six deaths uh, as of the time of this writing, and at least 100 injuries. This is not a hypothetical instance. This is actually happening. And these, the, these guys supplied almost the entire car industry. So the question is, if you were a design engineer on airbags at Takata, you might have thought, and it appears that these guys thought, your job was done when you proved that it worked. And then you might even say, we purposely chose those propellants to be long-term stable and work 20, 30 years from now and still save your life in case of a crash and et cetera. I'll bet they did that. I don't know, one way or the other. But what they didn't anticipate was in the presence of a lot of humidity, it might be that these propellants degrade, and then when they burn, they burn way too fast. And then when they do that, they blow up the canister and throw the metal at you. They didn't really anticipate that. So the question is, how, what should they have done differently, and what lesson can we learn from that? Because these guys know they have to design for the long term. In electronics, a lot of times we design for the next three years, and then hope to replace the system with another one, so our problems get sort of buried by the new wave of products. So. Let's see. The questions I think you have to ask are what might go wrong, what can I mitigate, and what about the things I can't mitigate? What do I do about those? You're not off the hook anymore. In electronics, I think we've typically said, well, if I can't mitigate it, I'll build some systems, test them out, see if I'm okay. If it looks good, we'll move forward. I'm saying, let's not stop at that answer anymore. Let's dig into that a little bit better. So we're, being, we're paying a lot of attention. I, I'm not saying there's, that, we're, that no one's watching aging effects in silicon. I know some of us doing that. But 20, 30, 40 years, are we doing that? I know it's a lot harder. So long-term surprises, implementation bugs. Here's another one of these. The DC-10, when it was first designed, airplane, is a cargo, is a big plane. It's like a 747 size plane. The cargo door in the back was, you know how planes, they were pressurized inside. And when you're way up in the air, there's a lot of pressure trying to push out on those planes. They're trying to open the doors. So the doors are typically designed so that they swing into the, and then they sit back against the, the fuselage so that the pressure's pushing them against the sort of the stops. The DC-10, for reasons I forget why, but they designed the door to open out. And that, that meant that that pressure, if that wasn't a perfect, perfectly latched door, the pressure might blow it open, and that's exactly what it did. And when that happened on multiple planes, when that happened, the cargo floor collapsed and it chopped off all three redundant control cables. See the pattern there? There it is again. Because why? The cables were running in the same place. And so if there was a catastrophic event that affected one, it affected all three. So you, the designer, might have said, hey, I specified triplicated cables for a reason. But when they went to implement it, they said, yeah, but that would have cost us a ton of, ton of money and it was much more convenient to run them all this way. So another subtle uh, reason why you, as a designer, 
must not take your attention off what you've designed until the dang thing is in production. You don't take it off just because they sort of said, well, I think we've got, we've got enough from you. We're going to go off and design the rest of the plane. You move on to the next design. I don't think that's a good idea. I think the, the creator knows what they intended, and they'd better watch it all the way through. How about nuclear plants that are put too close to the ocean? Now, you might say, well, per hindsight sure is easy, Bob, you know, but if you were the guy that designed Fukushima, yeah, that's who I'm talking about, um, maybe you would have done the same thing. And I'd say, I hope that that's not true. I would hope that, you'd, that I or any reason, per, reasonable person would say, if I have backup generators and they absolutely have to work if the plant gets into trouble, then for heaven's sakes, don't co-locate the backup generators exposed to the same threat as the thing that caused the problem in the first place. Put them somewhere else. It's just wires. Put them up on the hills. So clearly, that wasn't, they weren't put up on the hill far enough. There was a, a, the famous guy, Admiral Rickover, the, uh, the father of the nuclear navy. Uh, he was reputed to be a real turkey. The, a lot of people really didn't like him, but he was extremely effective at putting out a, a nuclear um, a fleet for the United States. Um, and he also was involved in some of the early commercial uh, nuclear plants. And his attitude was, don't put them in their cities, because no matter how careful you are, someday one of these plants might melt. And when it does, it's going, to re it's going to render uninhabitable a fairly large area, like Chernobyl did. Um, I think he was right. But as time went on, he died or retir retired or something. Uh, and then we started putting the plants wherever it was most convenient. And most of the people that were making the decisions weren't as aware of the technology as he was. So I think that was an example of somebody think, you know, really thinking hard about what the long-term implications are of these things. Um, and I mentioned this earlier, mission creep is always a problem. Here's another user interface. So there's a big ship. It's, that's a ferry. Um, and so one time when that ferry left the dock, it, somebody forgot to close the doors. Strange but true. And also, the pilot that was driving that ship had no indication on the dash whether the doors were closed or open. It was just a convention that the guy who was in charge of you know, putting the cars on and off the ferry would close the doors. It was as simple as that. And of course, that's what happened. Uh, he forgot to close the doors. The pilot didn't know. They cruised out into the water, took on a lot of water, flipped over sideways. Um, that's a user interface problem to me. Whoever designed that ship screwed up in the user interface. And the, the, it's, it's like, what? <laughs> that, remember the bonehead errors? To me, that's a bonehead user interface error. How about the USS Vincennes? We shot down an Iranian commercial airliner in 1988. If you actually look at that event, it's a user interface error. The, the person on, there was a Navy ship person um, on the Vincennes whose job it was to watch the radar and to make sense of what he was seeing, and his interface was wretched. He had to keep track of all kinds of crazy things in his own head. In effect, what he was doing was tracking the real airliner, but he was reading signals from a parked F-14, not knowing it. Of course, he wouldn't do that on purpose, but without knowing it. And so he made wrong decisions. He also was under duress because they thought they were under attack already and so on. So a bad thing happened. We lost a lot of people because of this user interface error. Here's another one. This is an airplane cockpit. There's a piece of it. And you can, without being a pilot or anything else, you can look at these di dials and you can see where the bar is against the range that the bar can take on. That's a really useful contextual clue to you as to you know, what the thing's trying to tell you. They work fine, but we can't leave fine well enough alone, so we designed a digital equivalent of it. And you can see roughly it looks the same, but the problem is that white bar isn't there anymore. And instead, they put little green bars outside where the actual condition of the plane was. Now the problem is that plane in question lost an engine and it was vibrating like crazy and you couldn't read the little bar anymore. So the pilots basically had to guess which engine went out and they guessed wrong and crashed the plane. User interface error. Um, so my, so what do we do about all this? I don't know, but I have a suggestion. Uh, when I walk into airplanes, the same thing runs through my head every time. I think, I'm about to get on a metal tube that has, I don't know how many subsystems on it, every one of which had better do its job for me to get to my, you know, where I'm trying to go without getting squashed. So I would like to know, how are the engines? Um, how's the nav system? How are the radios? How's the entertainment system at my seat? Um, what it, so I want it, and of course, I can't get the system to give me a printout that says every single one of them. I don't really want that. I want something to aggregate the answers to those questions and present it to me in such a way that I can use the result without having been trained on what's actually in the airplane, because I'm pretending to be a representative passenger here. So an example of a, of a kind of thing that does what I want 
is if the, so this is a voltage indicator. Uh, this is just one subsystem. Think of it as one subsystem. But here's the neat th part about it. It's got an unambiguous indication, and it's got ranges. It's got a low range and a high range and a mid range. The mid range, you would think, should be the nominal operating point of the system. And low and high would mean something bad might be happening. So if I see it in one of the two outside ranges, I already know something's screwy. If it's in the middle, but sort of at the edge, that might be a problem. That might be something worth checking on before I take off. Instead of just having the system go yes or no, that's, that's not good enough anymore. I want, I want better than that. Um, here's an example of what not to do. <laughs> Have you ever been in a cab in New York City? <laughs> Every one of them has that light on because... Yeah, exactly. You, you can just safely ignore that light because they, they don't know what it means. They, they think the car still seems to work. What the heck, right? But if this is a, if this is a space shuttle or, a, or a, an airplane, you better not take that attitude. Oh, and by the way, I also, I don't want to just know what the system, where the system's current status is. There could be a trend. It might be that over the last month, it's been trending higher and higher. So then if it's at the right edge of the range and it's been trending in that direction, now I'm really certain that there's something screwy going on, and I don't want to take off just knowing that it's in the green of the zone because it's way at the edge of the green zone. That trend, the, the situation and the trend, I think, is what matters. I want to aggregate those across all the subsystems and then give me the answer to that. And now I actually know something I can use to make a decision about whether to use the system. Uh, at DARPA, they always want to talk about exoskeletons for, for soldiers. You probably know that. It's a perennial thing. They, it's like in the, is it Alien? where Sigourney Weaver was inside the exoskeleton picking things up and looking formidable. Well, they always want to do that because soldiers, we're killing our soldiers. They're carrying way too much stuff in the, in the combat. They're walking too far with it. We would love to help them. But at some point, I pointed this out inside of DARPA and said, you know, if you're a soldier, you're 19 years old, you have no training in technology, you put this thing on and it had better work to get you where you're going. Not just that, it needs to get you back. So now I want to know what's the status of the battery um, how's, what's the current draw of all the motors? Is it within nominal range or one of them's kind of screwing up and it's about to sort of strand me out there where I'm going to get shot at? The, the, that stuff doesn't come naturally to designers. Naturally to designers just means what's the mission? Carry the soldier out there? Okay, I can do that. I just need some motors and batteries. We've got to get out of that. That's, that's old think. We can do better. All right. Um, oh, that's another thing. I would also like the systems that I rely on on a, ba on a normal basis, like my car, for example. When I park it in the driveway at night, or in the garage, hopefully, I would love it to get on my home network and then go out on the internet and say, how am I feeling? How am I doing as a car relative to my peer cars? Um, am I, is my fuel economy pretty good compared to them? If it's not, maybe my tires need to be inflated. Maybe the guy isn't driving me right. Maybe there's something wrong with the engine. There's, we could learn a lot from that. At one point, I brought this idea up with a friend that works in Detroit as an automotive engineer. And he said, no, that's never going to happen because there's too many service stations that make all their money by fixing what you broke. And I went, yeah, but we could do this. This would be better. He said, well, better for you, maybe. I went, well, we should still do this. Anyway, oh, it has to be non-spoofable, non-hackable, please. Let's not keep tacking security on at the end. It's a, that's a bad idea. Here's some lessons from the DOD having been at just DARPA. Um, the F-15 has been around a long time. It's a really good airplane, but it uses electronics that, have been, that were designed in, what, 1975? I mean, it's, it's old. And now the question is, when those chips break, whatever, how do you replace them? They're not, they haven't been in business for you know, decades. So what we do, uh, there's two things that we do. We, we, used to, we used to buy them on the gray market, where people were prying old chips off of boards and selling them back to us. And God knows what those chips were through, right? Were they tortured? Were they... Were they carefully monitored? Well, I don't know. Are they even legitimate parts? Another thing we do is we make counterfeit parts ourselves. I shouldn't call them counterfeit. We make replacement parts ourselves that aren't based on the same principles the original chip was. And then we try to convince ourselves they work the same way. Digital stuff, you can do that. But some of these chips are analog. And we make what we hope are equivalents for their functionality. How do you prove that the functionality is the same? We, we don't even have methodologies for that. We just kind of plug them in there and hope the plane works the same way it did before. So far, so good. We've got to do better than that. So we have to design for the long term. The DOD is up against that in a big way. Um, oh, in some of this stuff, nowadays, it used to be that the Par Department of Defense would design their own stuff. Um, now they don't, because the commercial silicon is so much better than what they can create themselves. They just buy it off the shelf like everybody else. Um, DARPA actually has, now this applies to software as well. DARPA has I've got a uh, program right now to try to create software that works for 100 years. 
I think that's kind of cool. I think that's a, I don't think they can do it, but I'm glad they're trying because I think it's in the vein of what we need to be working on. Um, so here's a soccer field that is not a level playing field. At one point, I showed this to an Air Force general. I was using it as, you know, if you use commercial off the shelf technology, so do the other side. And so you're on a, it's leveling the playing field and you don't like that. You like a non-level playing field. And he looked at that picture for a really long time and then he said, where is that? <laughs> and I, as seriously as I could, I said, it's on the internet. It's, <laughs> it's not real. But, but they haven't completely come to grips, they, DOD, have not completely come to grips with yet, in my opinion, with the implications of using so much commercial off-the-shelf electronics. There are some profound implications to that. It's hard to stay ahead of the other guy when you're starting from the same position. We didn't used to have that, now we do. This is another scary one. If, so this is Norm Augustine, the guy that used to run Martin Marietta. So he has a book out has from, for many years. But in it is a curve, and it shows the price per airplane of all the airplanes we've made across time from 1920 out to approximately the present day. And look carefully, you'll see this is an exponential uh, axis. It's not linear. And these airplanes are climbing just like Moore's Law. It should look like Moore's Law to you, right? <laughs> Except it's working against you because this is the price of the planes. Well, fair enough. The, oh, there's, the, but the, uh, on each, now by the way, there are, um, there are, there is a, an F-35 talking points that I just saw two days ago. And it's, the Air, it's what the Air Force would say if they were sitting here to that curve. And they'd say, well, let's just talk about the F-35. It's not as bad as you've been told. It's not a billion dollars per airplane. It's really like 140, but we're gonna drive it down to 60. And they do this little shuck and jive. And I think it's great. I think, I hope it's true, but the overall shape of that curve is the same. It is not leveling off. We don't know how to do that. And, and we also know we cannot sustain that curve. That is what's clear. We can't sustain this. In fact, Norm Augustine in his book, the way he characterizes it was, if you just go out a couple more generations past the F-35, um, we're going to be able to afford a single airplane. And the Air Force will have it for three days, then the Navy for three days, and the Marines can, <laughs> and the Marines can have it on Sunday. <laughs> it's like, it's funny, but it's not funny, because that's the curve we're on, and we know we can't keep doing it. And not, so you can ask the question, why is it doing that? Well, and I did at DARPA. I, what, why, what's behind that, and what can we do about it? Well, the guy that's in charge of it, he said, well, it's the software. He, said, he called the plane a flying software computer wasn't clear what he meant, but I think I get the gist. And then he says, software is a huge risk. We've got to do business differently. He doesn't know how, but he knows what the problem is. It's the software is holding him up, per his view. And then he said the gorilla in the room was, there's 24 million lines of code in there. Which is a little, it's like when you, if somebody tells you your car, if you have a Tesla, they'll tell you, oh, your car has, I don't know what the number is, 20 million lines of code or something. And, and that's, that may be literally true, but it's kind of silly to add the you know, million lines of code inside the nav system to the million lines of code in the radio. That's a little weird. What I want to know is, what is the total amount of code that's doing all the cool stuff in the car, like running the motors and the generators and the, and the brakes and so on? That's the thing that I think is where the complexity is going to be. So anyway, that's a picture of the plane. Uh, it's not really 24 million lines of code. The guy that's actually writing the code told me personally it's about 9 million lines, but that's still a lot. And anyway, I don't think that's the problem. I think you said complexity, Subhashis. I couldn't agree more. I, I think what's actually happening here is the designers of that system have thrown so much complexity into what they're asking this system to do. Well, guess where that complexity goes? You can't put it anywhere else except in the software. So the poor guy that's writing the software, he's going to get blamed for why are you so slow? Do you need a better language? Do you need better tools? Do you need better training? Do you need more people? And the answer is no, I don't need any of those. I need you to stop overloading me with complexity at, at a system level. It's just that it's only manifesting as software. That's an artifact. It's not the root cause. I don't think we've got that right yet. And there's an awful lot of people in positions of decision authority that don't understand that point at all, and it's tragic. We've got to get it across to them. I have a few things I wanted to say about neuromorphic. I actually, so DARPA funds some of that, and, and I think it's neat. I'm amazed every time I take my phone and talk to it. It amazes me how fast it gets the right answer almost all the time. But there's a problem with that approach that I think a lot of its practitioners just aren't admitting yet. Um, if Siri goofs, if I talk into it and I say, please find me a Chinese restaurant within three miles, and I look at the screen and it says, you know, something goofy, reads me a line of poetry, I'm going to go, well, that wasn't what I wanted. You know, cross that off, try again. But what if something equivalent to that, well, I didn't, that's not the point I want to make yet. If there's something equivalent to that uh, is inside of a decision loop that's controlling weapons or something, now what? Do you really want that? Wait, do you ever want that? 
That's, I think that's a legitimate question, and we shouldn't just assume that the answer is, yeah, when it's good enough, we'll know when to switch to it. I'm not sure. I think there's a difference in kind between what we know how to do and what neuro is going to bring us. And we need to face that before we fall into it. Oh, I was told at DARPA, at one point, the, the uh, agency director said, I love neuromorphic approaches. You don't have to program them. And I went, well, that's good in a way, but it's also a bad in a way, because, because you cannot tell it what to do. That's the, side, you know, the <laughs> other side of I can't program it. So the other thing is, now, I'm saying this, but I think I'm patting a target on my chest by saying this, but I'm going to say it anyway. We simply don't know what would happen under all circumstances. It's just the way neuromorphic approaches work. Now, you might say, well, even with your conventional systems, you can't say that. Now, can you? Fair, but in a different way, right? And also, there's a logical fallacy in saying, well, if you're already screwed up, can I be screwed up another way? No, that doesn't follow. Come on. We, all I'm saying is, let's march into neuromorphic land in a careful, controlled way and think about what we're doing. Also, I want to point out, the system will probably get better as it goes, but it's learning and it's changing its behavior as it goes, which means we, our uncertainty about what it's going to be capable of may also grow. Let's watch for that. Maybe there's something we can do about that. Maybe we can use that learning to, to diminish the amount of uncertainty, but that's not what's going to happen by default. Uh, also, I saw with IBM True North, was a, well, that was a DARPA-funded effort. Um, they said the underlying hardware must become sufficiently powerful to do in silicon what the brain does naturally. And I think, I have no reason to think that's true. I actually think the underlying hardware is not the limitation. I think our, un our understanding of what to do with it is a limitation, and it's not going to just pop into our head because we threw more transistors at it. An example of what I'm saying is, if I show you a set of pictures about pandas and giraffes and things, you're highly likely not to t mistake a giraffe for, say, a, a watermelon. You're not going to do it. But when these vision systems fail, they fail spectacularly, and they don't know they're failing. Like this one, these are all real examples. A, 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 a really good state-of-the-art vision system with high confidence said, that's a cheetah. And it, and it said, for example, that's a bubble and that's an electric guitar. No human would have ever done that. And we could not have predicted ahead of time that that would happen. And it, by the way, if we could have predicted it, the hackers would use that information to break our vision system. So we have to be really cognizant of the differences in kind of that kind of approach than the kind of computing that we're used to. I just wanted to mention the ends of Moore's Law, I think, is also going to change some of the rules here in terms of the bugs and the system it level things that I'm complaining about. Uh, I do agree uh, that all of these have a place and we need to explore them. Um, I think we're going to bring, when you start doing approximate computing, go find those people that used to call themselves numerical analysts. We need them. We don't have them anymore. We need them. Uh, I talked about the DOD. I think systems have to last longer, and I'm claiming that this is a different game that we're not used to. So. Let me just skip that and show you the final thing. I want to keep pushing CMOS up the hill till it's done. Obviously, right? There's a lot of money in that. We're not going to forget to do that. We're just going to do it. Uh, energy, is efficient, energy efficiency is required, but not optional, and it's not good enough to, tr to address what I'm concerned about. Um, this is a side comment. Parallel programming is not solved, and yet we're designing multiple you know, parallel systems all over the place. We better keep track of that. We need to still fix uh, know how to use what we're already creating. And then this is the Google self-driving car example. People are building what I call scary systems out of our stuff, and they know not what they do. So we need to think through the corner cases, worry about the use cases, and think about long term in a much better way than we've been doing. Otherwise, what we're going to see, I think, is lawsuits, poorly, poorly thought out laws, and bad things. Let's prevent those proactively. That's it. You talked about a lot of different things, and, 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 so, and it's, it's not true that there's a sim, single thread that goes through all of them, but one of the things I detect in a lot of what you were talking about is it's really economics. So a lot of things you're asking for are going to cost money, mm -hmm. and a lot of these things uh, are not going to bring any value to the original producer of the technology, because if it's a long-term thing, nobody who's running that company today gives a crap about what the system's going to do, do in 20 years. Most uh, the way we're set up today, some companies do think they're going to be in business 20 years from now, but the people who are running it aren't going to be running it, and they don't care. So what we need is some other force that comes in to enforce these kinds of requirements. That's called government regulation. Worst case, yeah. <laughs> what else? What else? What else you got? How are you going to? How are you going to set up a system that the producers are going to be incentivized 
to solve these problems you're talking about. That's, I think, the, where the real problem is. Mm. That's, if, we, if we had those incentives and they were economic, then they would, they would almost take care of themselves. But it's really hard to figure out how to do that. As, yeah, as no, that's a really good comment. I, I probably should have drawn attention to that when I was talking. I distinctly remember a discussion when I was at Intel, and I went to Andy Grove at one point and said, you know, it really bugs me that high school kids that with no knowledge can download a script and break my computer. I really hate that. And we should do, and there's things we could do about that. For example, every time I hear stack overflow, I pull my hair out. I can prevent every one of those. I can put things into the hardware that would absolutely rule that out. Hey, Andy, how about we do that? And, and it's not, I don't want to just patchwork it. I want to have a little group of people that can identify all the likely places, blah, blah, blah. And his answer was exactly on what you're saying. He said, well, let's see. You're suggesting that if I walk up to Fry's Electronics and there's two podiums and there's an AMD chip machine here and there's an Intel machine here and the user's going to go, well, that sort of works. Well, that sort of works. Hmm, which one's cheaper? And I, and I said, yes, but that doesn't let us off the hook. We're, we're polluting the world with systems that are susceptible to these diseases. We really should be taking them seriously, and maybe it wouldn't cost very much. He said, well, if it doesn't cost anything, come talk to me. But if as soon as it has a price tag, now you have to show me why I should do it. So you're absolutely right. I agree with your point. My, my intention with the talk was to sort of draw attention to this problem without necessarily solving it, because I don't really know how to solve it. You're, you're exactly right, and I'm afraid that if we don't come up with an, a way of addressing that incentive issue, the government really will have to step in. It just takes a few dead bodies to wake them up. Well, and, and we're going to feel terrible as technologists if that ever comes to that. But, and, and usually the laws that they pass are lousy. I, I just ho I'm hoping there's a way to address your problem. I don't necessarily know what it is at this moment. Bob, I have a solution to that. <laughs> cool. <laughs> you guys get together. Bob Colwell has to go back to DARPA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I solved it so thoroughly the first time. I, I have a related question. Is anyone listening? You are obviously are not speaking. You are speaking about this frequently, not just to us. So. Yeah. Um, geez, I don't know. But that's, I don't get discouraged easily, so what the heck. Um, that, I good. actually think designers usually react, uh, they resonate pretty strongly with it and say, yeah, I hear your message. Uh, I, I've got schedules. I've got performance goals. I've got blah, blah, blah. And I say, that's true. And for all you know, this might be yet another turn of the wheel in which you get away with having ignored this problem. On the other hand, this might be the one where this comes and bites you. And then you'll be sorry that you didn't try to anticipate rather than react. But yeah, I don't know. I'm hoping it gets, you know, sometimes it takes a, a lot of pushing before you get any traction on stuff like this. So I'm not discouraged yet, but that's about the best I can do so far. Don't be. Hmm? Question? Okay, well, if there's no further questions, I want to thank you again. Oh, you're welcome.